Welcome back, everybody, to the deep dive. Today, um, we're going to be tackling, well, not really tackling, more like yeah. deep diving into a decision that many people with wet AMD, you know, find themselves kind of wrestling with to treat or not to treat. And we're going deep into this decision aid that's been designed to help patients just like you kind of navigate this whole choice. So think of this deep dive as your shortcut to understanding all the key facts and figures about wet AMD and its main treatment. Uh, anti-VGF injections by the end. Hopefully you'll be well equipped to, you know, weigh the potential benefits and risks and figure out what matters most to you in this decision. Yeah. And it's a big decision. And, yeah. uh, you know, this decision aid doesn't really sugarcoat the situation. It starts with a pretty blunt statement. It says, if you don't have any treatment, your vision is more likely to get worse. Okay. Wow. So that definitely sets the stage. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's make sure we're all on the same page here. Now, mm -hmm. we know you're already familiar with wet AMD. But for the sake of this deep dive, could you quickly remind us how this condition affects our vision? Absolutely. So, wet AMD affects the central part of your vision, that sharp, detailed vision, you know, mm -hmm. the vision that you need for everyday tasks, like reading or recognizing faces. It all comes down to leaky blood vessels in the back of the eye that cause fluid buildup and damage to the macula which is responsible for that central vision. Gotcha. So not just blurry vision in general, it's more like having a blurry patch right in the center, like right where you need to see the most. Exactly. And what's really important to understand is that vision loss tends to happen fastest in the early stages of wet AMD. That's why early detection and treatment are so, so critical. We want to try and intervene yeah. you know, before significant damage occurred. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So yeah. let's talk about the treatment that this decision aid focuses on, oh. anti-VEGF injections. What can you tell us about how they work? Okay. So Anti-VEGF injections, they target a protein called yeah. VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. Um, this protein is basically the culprit behind those leaky blood vessels in the eye. The injections block VEGF, which helps stop the leaking and prevents further vision loss. Okay. Oh. Mm. So it's not just about like hitting the brakes on vision loss. There's a chance that these injections could actually improve vision if they're given early enough. That's right. The decision aid points out that treatment might improve sight for some people if caught early enough. Which is why that early detection we talked about is so crucial. I see. So let's talk about the actual procedure itself. I mean, <laughs> I think we can all agree. Nobody loves the thought of needles near their eyes. Yeah. But how do these injections actually work? Well, the decision aid describes the injections as small injections in the white part of your eye, which, you know, <laughs> sounds a lot scarier than it actually is. <laughs> they take less than 30 seconds to administer. And your eye is numbed beforehand, so you shouldn't feel any pain. Okay. That's good to know. So yeah. it sounds like a pretty quick and relatively painless procedure. Yes. And it's typically done in an outpatient setting, so you wouldn't need to stay overnight in a hospital or anything like that. Okay, great. So far, so good. Uh, but I think where things get really interesting is when we start looking at the data. Right. The decision aid provides some statistics about the potential benefits and risks of treatment. Absolutely. And the source lays out the beta in a way that's designed to be easy to understand. It talks about what happens out of every hundred people after one year of treatment. Okay. I like where this is going. Let's dive into those numbers. What does the data tell us about the potential benefits of these injections? All right. So for people who received anti-VEGF injections, about 20 out of every hundred saw their vision improve after a year. And about 70 out of a hundred stayed about the same. So their vision didn't get worse. Now, if we compare that to people who chose not to have treatment, only five out of every hundred saw their vision improve, and 57 out of 100 stayed about the same. Wow. So <laughs> just looking at those numbers, there seems to be a real advantage to getting the treatment, at least in terms of maintaining or even improving your vision. Yes. But here's the catch. And it's a crucial point highlighted in the decision aid. Those are just averages, you see. The potential benefits of anti-VEGF treatment can vary quite a bit depending on how good your vision is right now, before you even start treatment. Hmm. So you're saying what works for the average person might not necessarily apply to me specifically. Exactly. It really depends on your individual situation, the stage of your wet AMD, and other factors that your specialist will be able to assess. The decision aid even encourages readers to ask your specialist how these numbers apply to you. Right. That makes a lot of sense. It's a good reminder that we can't just look at overall statistics and assume they'll apply to everyone equally. This is where that personalized guidance from your doctor becomes so important. Absolutely. And the same goes for understanding the potential risks of treatment. Even though the injections are generally considered safe, there are some risks to be aware of. Yeah. Because let's be real. 
No medical procedure is completely without risk. Exactly. And the source breaks down the risks of anti-VEGF injections using this format. For every 1,000, 10,000 injections, it helps put the likelihood of these risks into perspective. Okay. Let's break down those risks. What are some of the things that someone considering these injections should be aware of? All right. So, for every 100 injections, about 30 people experience some temporary symptoms. Things like, hmm, you know, specks in their vision, a red or sore eye, or high pressure inside the eye. These usually clear up within 48 hours. So those sound a bit like what you might experience after any kind of injection. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. a little uncomfortable, but not necessarily a major cause for concern. Yeah, that's right. But then there are the more serious risks, though they are thankfully much rarer. For every 10,000 injections, about four people experience a serious eye infection called endophthalmitis. Hmm. And this is where it gets serious because endophthalmitis can cause permanent vision loss. Hmm. So it's crucial that anyone considering these injections understands this risk, however small. What else should we know about the risks? Well, the decision aid also mentions a few other potential risks, like hmm. bleeding inside the eye, glaucoma, retina damage, cataract, and the possibility of needing further surgery. But again, it's important to remember that these are relatively rare occurrences. Okay, so... It sounds like there are definitely risks associated with anti-VEGF injections. Yeah. But for the most part, they're considered safe. And the more serious risks are pretty uncommon. Oh. But it's definitely a lot to consider. The statistics definitely help paint a picture. But they're just one piece of the puzzle, right? You got it. Those numbers give us valuable information. But the decision isn't just about crunching the numbers. It's about understanding how those numbers fit into your own life and individual circumstances. So what else should someone be thinking about when making this decision? What other factors come into play? Well, the decision aid is really good about reminding us that this is a personal decision and mm -hmm. there's more to it than just the data. Yeah. It really encourages you to think about your individual context, for example. Are there any potential difficulties with the treatment itself that you need to consider? So <laughs> like, you know, things like fitting frequent hospital visits into your schedule and the ability to keep up with those appointments over time. Exactly. Think about the practical side of things. How easy is it going to be for you to get to those appointments? Do you have someone who can drive you? Those are all things you'll want to talk to your specialist about. Right. It's all about looking at the whole picture, not just the medical side of things. Right. And it's also important to think about wet AMD in the bigger picture, not just what's happening in one eye at this moment. Hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, for starters, it's more common than you might think. The decision aid gives some context about wet AMD as a whole, it points out that there are over half a million people in the UK alone who have it. And it breaks down the prevalence by age group. The older you get, the more likely you are to develop it. So it's not some rare condition that only affects a small number of people. Exactly. And here's another thing to consider. Even if you've only been diagnosed in one eye, there's a chance it could affect the other eye as well. Oh, wow. That's a bit concerning. What are the chances of that happening? The source gives this example. If we took 100 people with wet AMD in just one eye yeah. after five years, we'd expect to see about 28 of them develop wet AMD in both eyes. Even if you're managing it in one eye, you can't just assume the other one is going to be fine? Exactly. And while we don't know the exact cause of wet AMD, the decision aid points out that lifestyle factors can influence the risk of it affecting the other eye. Things like smoking, high blood pressure, and being overweight can all increase your risk. Mm. That's a good reminder that we do have some control over our eye health, even if we can't control everything. So, We've talked a lot about the statistics and the medical side of things, but I think it's important to acknowledge the emotional side of this decision, too. I mean, facing potential vision loss can be really scary, right? Absolutely. And the decision aid acknowledges that. It encourages you to think about your values and priorities. Mm -hmm. What's most important to you when it comes to your vision and your quality of life? Yeah, I imagine for a lot of people, yeah, maintaining their independence and being able to do the things they love are really high on that list. For sure. And those are things that might be impacted by vision loss. So it's about weighing those personal values against the potential benefits and risks of treatment. Right. It's like trying to find the best balance for you. Exactly. What are you willing to do to potentially preserve your vision? Are you comfortable with the idea of regular injections for possibly several years? How do you feel about the potential risks involved? It's a lot to think about. Yeah. And I imagine it can feel overwhelming at times. But this decision aid does a good job of breaking it down into manageable steps, doesn't it? It really does. And it constantly reminds you that you don't have to go through this alone. Talk to your specialist. Talk to your loved ones. Do your research. The more informed you are, 
the more confident you'll feel in making the decision that's right for you. Okay, so let's say you've done all that. You've read through the decision aid, you've talked to your specialist, and you've thought about your personal values and priorities. Now you're ready to actually make a decision. What happens next? Well, if you decide to go ahead with the anti-VEGF injections, the decision aid stresses that you'll have your first injection as soon as possible. Okay, so. No time to waste. Not really, they're pretty clear about that. Okay. The sooner you start, the better the results. And what if you decide not to have treatment? Well, the decision aid doesn't shy away from the potential consequences. It very plainly states that your sight is likely to get worse. It's a tough reality to face, but I appreciate that the decision aid is upfront about it. Right. It's important to go into this with your eyes wide open. So, it really comes down to weighing the risks and benefits and deciding what you're most comfortable with. Exactly. There's no right or wrong answer here. It's about what's right for you. Okay, so we've talked about the decision-making process itself, but I want to circle back to something we touched on earlier. The importance of early detection. Absolutely. Early detection is key when it comes to wet AMD. The decision aid emphasizes this over and over again. Why is it so important to catch it early? Because the sooner you start treatment, the better your chances of preserving your vision. The decision aid even gives a statistic about how quickly vision can decline after diagnosis. On average, people lose five letters or one line on an eye chart within the first three months. Wow, that's a pretty rapid decline. It is, and that's why it's so crucial to be aware of the symptoms of wet AMD and to see an eye doctor right away if you notice any changes in your vision. So what are some of the warning signs that people should be looking out for? Well, remember that wet AMD affects the central part of your vision. So you might notice a blurry patch right in the middle of your field of vision, or straight lines might start to look wavy or distorted. Gotcha, those sound like pretty clear red flags to me. They are, and luckily, there are some simple tests that your eye doctor can do to check for wet AMD. They might use an eye chart to see how many letters or lines you can read, or they might use a special grid called an Amsler grid to check for any distortions in your vision. Okay, so those tests can help catch it early when treatment is most likely to be effective. Exactly, and it's a good reminder that even if you don't have any symptoms, it's still a good idea to get regular eye exams, Yeah. especially as you get older. Right, okay. So we've covered a lot of ground here today. We've talked about the science behind wet AMD, the potential benefits and risks of treatment, the importance of personalized decision-making, and the crucial role of early detection. It's a lot to take in, but I think it's important to remember that this decision aid while incredibly informative, is just one piece of the puzzle. I completely agree. It's a great starting point, but it shouldn't be the only resource you consult. So what else can someone do to feel empowered in making this decision? Well, first and foremost, talk to your specialist. They're your best resource. They can answer any specific questions you have, address your concerns, and help you weigh the pros and cons based on your individual needs and circumstances. Yeah. And the decision aid actually provides a really handy list of questions to ask your specialist. It does. It covers everything from the nitty gritty details of the treatment procedure to the potential side effects mm -hmm. to what you can expect in the long term. Yeah. It even encourages you to talk about your personal goals and expectations for treatment. Exactly. It's all about having that open and honest dialogue with your doctor to make sure you're both on the same page. Don't be afraid to advocate for yourself. Ask for clarification if you don't understand something. And don't hesitate to express your concerns or preferences. You're the one who has to live with this decision, so you need to feel comfortable and confident with the path you choose. Couldn't agree more. It's so reassuring to know that there's support out there. It really does make a difference knowing you have resources and a community to turn to. So, yeah. As we wrap up this deep dive into wet AMD and the decision of whether or not to treat, I want to leave you with one final thought. We've explored the science, the statistics, the personal factors, and even where to find support. But at the end of the day, the decision is yours and yours alone. That's right. It's a personal decision that deserves careful consideration. And an open conversation with your doctor, they're there to guide you and help you make the choice that aligns best with your individual needs and values. We've thrown a lot of information your way today, but knowledge really is power. In these situations, the more you understand about wet AMD and the treatment options, the better equipped you'll be to make an informed and empowered decision. So as you move forward, what are some of the key questions you'll be taking to your specialist? Yeah. What aspects of this deep dive resonated most with you? Was it the potential for vision improvement, the long-term commitment of treatment, or maybe the peace of mind that comes with actively managing your eye health? Whatever your priorities are, 
Remember that this deep dive has hopefully given you a solid foundation for having a productive conversation with your doctor. We've given you the tools to ask the right questions and advocate for your needs. And remember, there's no right or wrong answer here. It's about finding the path that feels right for you, a path that aligns with your personal values and priorities. We wish you the very best on your journey. To better vision and informed decisions. And to everyone listening, thank you for joining us on The Deep Dive. We'll be back soon with another deep dive into a fascinating topic. Until then, keep exploring, keep learning, and keep asking those important questions.